welcome to our session. We are so Woo. thrilled to have you all here. Uh, we have a full session for you today about closing the key gaps of serverless with Azure Functions. Uh, so I'm Jeff Holland. I'm a program manager on the Azure Functions team. And I'm Alex Kersher. I'm also a program manager on the Functions team. Uh, we also have an honorable mention, Matt Henderson, who couldn't be with us, but his slides will live on in his memory <laughs> you, you for this presentation. And you can see him at the booth later uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, but thank you very much. This will be a very high energy session. <sighs> have we ever presented together at a public conference before? Uh, no, no, no. This Only <laughs> under the cover of darkness. <laughs> Uh, so for the agenda today, uh, we've got a lot of exciting things to talk about. We've kind of split this up into three sections. We're going to think about three different uh, kind of problems that you have to solve, or I guess three different pivots when you're building a serverless application. Uh, so we're going to start with talking about hosting, some of your hosting options, uh, some of the new features that we've announced to give you even more hosting options, uh, including the premium plan and CADA. Uh, we're going to talk about securing your functions uh, using things like Key Vault to pull in secrets uh, for your serverless code and having managed identities. And then we're going to close off by talking about implementing everybody's favorite two words, dependency injection. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there it is. An applause a minute and a half in. Uh, we're going to tell you that that is coming soon at Ignite, and we're really excited to tell you about that announcement. No, we, it's, it's a, it, it released today, and we'll, and we'll talk <laughs> about dependency injection. Uh, and then Dev, there were a few people who were like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so Alex, start with uh, hosting. Take it Woo. away. So the first, uh, the, the first kind of gap that we're going to look to address is a bunch of different hosting options in the serverless, uh, in the serverless world, in the functions world. And the first thing I want to start with is our hosting matrix. This is one of the biggest things that people come to us and ask questions about, kind of how should I be hosting my function. And I want to put this slide up for everybody because this is the reality of our hosting matrix. Azure Functions is an open source project with a GitHub repo, and you can take that runtime and run it in a bunch of different places. And that's kind of how I like to simplify our hosting matrix. When you think about how you can run your functions, think about functions as both an SDK and a bunch of different hosting options. So you can take that SDK and run it locally, you can take that SDK and run it a bunch of different ways in Azure, and you can take that SDK outside of Azure and run it in a bunch of different options. And I kind of want to have this slide so that when you go back and talk to your managers and bosses and other developers, you can show them this is what we have to deal with in functions land. Um, Specifically, uh, at Build, uh, a couple of weeks before Build, we're taking the wraps off of our newest hosting plan, the Premium Plan. Uh, and actually, jumping back, this is something that's meant to fill a lot of the scenarios that the App Service Plan, the dedicated hosting mode for functions, offered in a serverless consumption build mode. Um, so the first thing that the, that the Premium Plan offers is serverless scale with bigger configurable instances. We're off of the A-series VMs that the consumption plan runs on, and you get to run on beefy D-series VMs. You can choose from a one-core, three-and-a-half gig RAM machine up to a four-core, 12 gig machine. Uh, also in the Premium Plan, we're giving you controls for cold start. Uh, you can set a minimum plan size and a number of pre-warmed instances. I'll get into that in a lot more detail later. We also have enhanced VNet connectivity close to the level that the App Service Plan offers. We'll also get into that a little bit later. In the Premium Plan, we can let you run longer. Uh, we hope for it to be unlimited run duration, but in the public preview phase, it's about 25 minutes per execution that you can run in the Premium Plan. And we're also giving you predictable billing and scale controls by being able to set a maximum scale out for your plan. So let's get into what we're giving you in terms of cold start controls in the Premium Plan. And I want to start with a graph of serverless scale, as it has been shown in every serverless meetup since the beginning of time. In Teal, we have the load coming into your website. And in kind of uh, uh, dark blue, black, we have the number of available instances. And in the perfect conceptual world, you have no instances running. And then the moment you receive requests, you instantly have one app, you have one instance available. When that instance is totally loaded, you instantly have a second instance available, and so on and so forth. And for the most part, this can be the case if you have a really lean, really small application. But a lot of our customers have cold start curves that look something like this, where when your first request comes in, it's a long time until that first instance is available. And if you have something like a big ML model or a lot of dependencies, that could be just an inevitable fact of your application. 
So in, in an instance like this, it can be a long time until your first instance becomes available, and that doesn't just hurt you on the first request, it hurts you all the way up the scale curve as your app is, is struggling to have enough instances available to deal with that load. So in the premium plan, what we're allowing you to do is pre-warm a number of instances, and it makes your scale curve look something like this, where you have one instance running all of the time when you're at the zero scale point, and then as you need more instances, we pre-warm more for you. And a huge, uh, a huge clarification for the public preview of this, this is actually all within your minimum plan size. So if you have six instances of your minimum plan size, we're going to pre-warm instances up until that limit, and then we're going to follow the normal cold start curve. And this is to try to save you cost and also allow you to pack apps much more densely in the premium plan. Uh, in the app service plan, every instance needs to run, or every app needs to run on every instance. So if you have a minimum plan size of three, every app in your app service plan will be running on that, whereas in the premium plan, you can have one app per, or however we want to dynamically allocate it. So if we, for example, move our minimum plan size down to three, you can see that up until the third instance, you will be pre-warming instances, and then after that, you'll be following your normal cold start curve. And our hope is that with those bigger, beefier instances, by the time you have however much your minimum plan size running, you're not seeing big, long cold starts. You're just seeing a little bit longer latency as your app is a little bit under-provisioned, but will eventually catch back up. Um, and we're experimenting with adding the ability to pre-warm outside of your plan size. Hopefully, we'll have that by GA. Uh, part of the caveat with that is that it'll mean that you'll be basically paying for a VM that you'll never, ever use, um, which is part of why we prioritized a couple of other things for public preview. So that's all cool in practice, but let's get into an actual demo of the scale of the premium plan and the consumption plan. Uh, so what I want to start with is our baseline uh, consumption app scaling, and I have my live metric stream here. This is the App Insights live metric stream. It's going to show us how many instances are running, and you can see for a consumption plan with no load, we are at that zero point. There are no instances online, and so I'm going to hop over to a load test here. I'm going to throw it 800 requests per second and watch it scale up. Um, so this is Loader.io. This is an external load test that's going to make sure that I have you know, nothing fancy up my sleeves. I'm not using a VSTS demo that <laughs> is going to be perfectly Azureified. You, you paid the VSTS team I paid the VSTS team. Um, so you can see here, as our app starts, uh, starts running, you can see our, our average latency climb pretty high as we build up an HTTP request queue. Um, and I can actually see on here, eventually, my app will become online. Let me give it a moment. Um, but you can, see, you can see that latency curve where as my HTTP request grows, my average request time grows pretty high. And then as my, as my app scales out more and more, you're going to see my, uh, my request latency drop as I have more instances available to handle that load. And eventually, this green line, which shows my active connections, is going to drop down. No idea why that, uh, that live metric stream isn't working, but that's OK. Um, we can see on here, we can see on here this guy after about 30 seconds is still struggling to deal with this load, which makes sense. That's pretty normal for a, uh, for a consumption app. Um, here, I'm actually going to, in the interest of time, just move right along to the premium plan. Who knows what's going on there? Um, if I go over to a premium plan running the same Hello World code, uh, you can see that I already have one app, uh, one instance available for this plan. Um, I have up here at the top, up, up, up. I have up here at the top uh, one server online already. Uh, this is my, my pre-warmed instance. Uh, this app actually has a minimum plan size of two and a pre-warmed instance count of one. Uh, so I am going to go over to Loader.io, and I am going to run, uh, I'm going to run Alkarshi Premium Load over here. Uh, and rather than giving it 800 requests a second for a consumption app, I'm going to throw it a little bit something beefier. This is running on bigger VMs, so it should be able to handle something like 1,200 requests per second. Uh, and so I'm going to keep my eye on that average request time. Uh, and you can see my app immediately for that first request has 33 milliseconds of average load time. A little bit of bump as I scale out to that second instance, but it's overall staying, oh, actually up to three instances. Uh, it's overall staying much lower. My average request time never goes above 100 milliseconds. Um, and those are the cold start controls that we're giving you in the premium plan. Yeah, and just here, here too, to uh, like the consumption plan is still incredibly valuable, and it scales incredibly fast. Like, it didn't load the, the App Insights view when, Col uh, I'm sorry, when Alex just did that test a second ago. Uh, but in the consumption plan, what you actually notice is that as it's getting those requests behind the scenes, we go from something like zero instances 
to 30 or 40 instances running your app in about 30 seconds. So it takes us, we're adding like 10 instances a second. It's there, or 10 instances, whatever the math is, three instances a second, thank you. Uh, uh, but, but the consumption plan is incredibly elastic, incredibly rapid, and for many scenarios it works perfect. It's great. It's like, hey, I have this running on an event stream. I know that you can scale out very quickly. I don't know how many of you have gone into the Azure portal and clicked like file, new, server. Uh, it doesn't do three every second. It takes a lot longer. So we've done a bunch of optimizations here for you. But we have found that a lot of people are like, hey, that's great that you can do 30 instances in 30 seconds, um, but I really need to have instant response times. I need that 30 millisecond response on the first request of the 1,200 requests. And that's where this premium plan that Alex just showed you gives you that ability to now close that gap. You have the option to make the engineering decision to say, hey, this is a synchronous function. I want this to be in the premium plan. I can flip that knob. I'm not changing the app in any way. I'm not changing the code. It's just a published gesture where I now target a premium plan, and now you get this instant ready to request pre-warmed instance that gives you that reliable cold start all of the time. So very cool stuff. Yeah, and you actually have the option in the premium plan to set your pre-warmed instances down to zero. So if you had three apps all in the same plan and you said, hey, I have this app that's a background task that doesn't need to be loaded all the time, you can have it still on those beefier VMs with all of your VNet connectivity and max scale out, but not actually pre-warmed on any instances. All right. Uh, so that was a scale demo. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, the next kind of serverless gap, what we're looking to fill with the premium plan, and that is our network isolation controls. Um, a lot of enterprise applications, a lot of production applications need resources out of the public internet. Um, moving, moving right along, this is, our, this is our matrix of networking features. This is pulled right out of the documentation. I wrote this talk about a month ago after the 100th email of people asking the different network support options. And I want to put this in the hosting, ver uh, the hosting section of this slide because these controls are available per hosting option. So if you build an application and then in the implementation phase try to figure out how to configure network isolation, you're going to have a bad time. And you will almost certainly have to redeploy your application because you realize you're either paying too much or too little for the level of network isolation that you need. So the consumption plan has basic inbound IP restrictions available. The premium plan in preview has inbound IP restrictions, virtual network, the, the preview virtual network integration, and service endpoint support for private site access. The app service plan has the GA version of virtual network integration and hybrid connections. And then the app service environment has the whole suite of network isolation available to it. So let's dive a little bit more into what the premium plan is giving you with that VNet integration and service endpoint support. Um, I love this slide because it shows exactly how service endpoints work. Um, service endpoints in Azure give you the ability to whitelist an application to only accept traffic from one VNet. And it actually works by configuring the inbound front end to only accept traffic from that VNet, and it configures the VNet with an implicit route out to that front end. So the HTTP front end actually accepts traffic in from the general internet and, and then immediately rejects it. Um, and then the VNet is connecting to that app using its public IP and public host name, but the front end knows, hey, this traffic is tagged coming from the VNet. I'm going to accept it and forward it along to the function app. Uh, we also have VNet integration in the premium plan, and that allows you to connect your function app to a virtual network. And an important, an important note about both of these features is that they do not restrict your function's ability to call out to the general internet. So as you're developing your app, you need to make sure that the dependencies that you add are secure, and if you don't want to call out to the internet, you don't have any dependencies that call out to the internet. Um, which leads me to something that I want to I just touch on very quick, which is that we do have the app service environment offering that gives you full virtual network isolation. It's not serverless. It's, in fact, entirely single tenant. You set up a whole copy of the app service multi-tenant option, and you pay pretty handily for it. But this is available if you have true isolated networking needs. So I'm going to get into a demo of what I have set up for virtual network integration. And this is the scenario that I have. I have a virtual network set up with a top secret VM running my top secret default WordPress site. Um, and I would like to set up a faux kind of private website, private little web service that's going to talk to that site. 
So I have a jump box configured so that I can pretend that my demo machine is in the virtual network. In the production world, you would want to configure a VPN up to your virtual network or an express route or something, or just have other instances inside of the virtual network. And I have service endpoints and virtual network integration configured with this function app. And it's going to allow me to take this path kind of from here in the conference center over to my virtual network jump box through the service endpoint to my function app running in multi-tenant Azure. And then the function app is going to be able to call out through the virtual network integration to my top secret VM. Uh, so I'm going to hop over here to my jump box. Uh, and you can tell that it's inside of my VNet because it's here in this dome. Um, <laughs> And I actually, I could, I could show my work. I have, I, have, uh, I have my PowerShell window open, and I can do an IP config. Uh, sorry, I didn't make that font size a little larger. I will just zoom in this way. Um, oh, it's so slow. Oh, it's so slow to zoom in an in a RDP session. Um, but you can see that I have, uh, I have my 10.0.0.4 private IP clearly inside of my virtual network. Um, oh, I'm zooming out so slowly. Uh, there we go. Ooh, geez. Um, so I'm here, I'm here inside of my virtual network, and I'm going to open up my web browser, and I'm going to go to my function app. Uh, this function app is called Virtual Network FX, and it has an HTTP trigger on here just to show that I can access my function app, this top secret default HTTP trigger. Uh, and I'm going to go now back to my demo machine that's on the public internet. You can see no dome um, <laughs> here on the public internet. Uh, and if I go over to this app, uh, you can see that I get nothing back from it. I get a 403 back. So I can reach the front end, but it rejects my traffic with a 403. Um, so now if I go back over to this, uh, the, and if I go back over to my VNet, I have my function connected, and I actually have a proxy set up in my function that's going to allow me to create my really simple, uh, my really simple kind of private website. So I have this proxy set up so that I reach my function app at this route slash plant, and then my function app is going to call out to my WordPress VM with my top secret default <laughs> template on it uh, at this 10.0.0.5 address. So if I take this address from my virtual network and I call it, uh, if I take this address and I go to it, you can see that I can now reach this function. Here, let me actually paste that correctly. Uh, I can now reach this function, and that function is going to reach into my WordPress site, and it's going to pull out my, my top secret default image. Uh, and so this is, this is a very simple scenario, super, super straightforward, of how you can configure service endpoint support and VNet integration to let this function that's hanging out in the public multi-tenant Azure access a virtual network resource and be secured through service endpoint support. Woo. Perfect. Uh, so hopefully that shows some of the matrix options, where as you have resources in a VNet, if you need to communicate with a VNet or restrict requests, to only trigger uh, from when it's coming from within the VNet. Uh, Alex did a great job showing those there. And, and as he even showed, one of his slides was straight up a screenshot from Docs. Uh, so if you go to docs.microsoft.com, Alex has written two or three at this point really good uh, articles, two and an FAQ. Two and a half. Yeah, uh, about networking. All right, so let's pivot and talk about everyone in the serverless world's favorite topic, which is Kubernetes. Uh, I, almost, I almost did like some curse word symbols here, because in some <laughs> cases, Kubernetes is a bit of a curse word in the serverless world, because in many ways, Kubernetes is helping you manage your infrastructure easier. Uh, but I'm going to talk about why we think that Kubernetes is an important piece of the serverless story. Uh, but before I do, just by a simple raise of hands, how many of you here uh, have used Kubernetes before? Uh, in some form or fashion. Okay, great, nice. so a little less than half. And then how many of you feel like you understand Kubernetes enough that you could explain kind of how it works to a coworker? Like you actually know, okay, so about, yeah, it, which is understandable, yeah. there's a lot there. So I, I ex expected that would be the case, so I have a single slide here where I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Kubernetes is doing. I actually had a second slide that I almost wish would have been better. Uh, so imagine each one of these little circles, that's a container. That's some container that is running a web app or an HTTP endpoint. Maybe that container is consuming messages from a queue. Doesn't really matter. And I need to now run this container in production. And very likely, I don't have just a single machine that's going to run that container. I have lots of machines that need to run that container because I need to be able to scale out. And what, what Kubernetes does is it provides a single interface, a single API for your operations team 
to deploy these containers, and Kubernetes does all the magic and makes it so that all of your infrastructure, all of your servers, uh, feel just like a single server. And it will load balance in and drop like, hey, your front end is getting a lot of requests. I'm gonna run it on six of these machines. Maybe your database isn't getting a lot of requests. It can just run on one of these machines. And Kubernetes just does that all for you. But there is a lot of management involved. Like even with the Azure Kubernetes service, we manage the master for you. We, we manage updates for you. But you still require some operations know-how. This is an operator's tool to help manage and scale. Uh, but it is, it is something that's important. We, uh, we hear a lot of companies who are making huge investments in Kubernetes, and it's an incredible piece of technology. So something that we announced yesterday, and I'm gonna show here in just a minute, is a project called Kata, uh, which is a Kubernetes-based event-driven auto-scaling. Now, even before I get there, I'll show this picture again very quickly. When Kubernetes is trying to decide how many of those dots to run in each machine, by default, it's kind of limited in that it's just looking at like how much CPU and how much memory are being consumed. It's pretty reactive. Uh, it's, it's trying to guess how much instances will be needed. Whereas in Alex's scale demo, when I talk about how we go from like one instance to 30 instances in about 30 seconds for HTTP, we're not just looking at the CPU of those functions. We've learned from running our service that is much too slow. And sometimes I might write a function that's consuming messages from a queue that never goes super high in CPU because I don't really want to run this thing uh, too hot. Uh, so we can't just rely on the CPU metrics. So how Azure Functions actually works is we are very aware of the event source. We know about your queue and we are watching the queue length. And we can see things like, oh hey, this queue has 100 messages on it. We need to spin up maybe not just one instance, but four instances or five instances. Now that's a concept that's foreign to the world of Kubernetes by default. So Kata is an open source project. We actually partnered with Red Hat to build this, which is a component that you can install into any Kubernetes cluster, Azure Kubernetes service, your on-premises Kubernetes, Red Hat OpenShift. It works natively with the Azure Functions tooling because what this does is it tells Kubernetes how to scale containers the same way that functions scale in the function service. It's looking at the event source, it's proactively saying, hey, there's a lot of things here to be done on your queue, on your event hub. We see a lot of requests coming in. So we can then scale out accordingly, which is the same way that functions work. You can scale to zero, scale to 1,000, and this just works with Azure Functions today. Uh, so because this is how functions expect to be scaled, you can take any function, new or existing, uh, and deploy it to Kubernetes uh, to run in Kata. Uh, so how Kata works, this is more complexity than is really needed. You can go to the GitHub page, which I think I just linked to in the past, because uh, this is on GitHub. And actually, yeah, here's a shameless plug. For all of you who have a GitHub account, <laughs> if you go to github.com slash Kata core slash Kata, there's that little star button where you can star a repo. Wow, wow. That would be an incredibly productive thing to do, even right <laughs> now while I finish this sentence. GitHub.com slash Kata core slash Kata. Uh, so anyway, or Kata.sh, shorthand. Uh, so uh, how Kubernetes works is really, it's an additional component that's monitoring your event source, it's very event aware, and it's feeding that event data back into the Kubernetes system. So that Kubernetes now knows about your event source, it knows about your queue, it knows about your event hub, and then it can scale your containers the same way that function scales because now we've given it that knowledge. So this might make more sense when you actually see it in action. So I'm gonna do a quick demo here, very quick. I have here a Azure function. This is a C-sharp function, uh, not doing anything fancy. It's going to trigger on a storage queue. In fact, it's going to trigger on this storage queue called queue. And right now the queue is empty, okay? Uh, I could now, the same way I can with any function, this could have been in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, I could set a breakpoint here I could debug this, I could drop a message in the queue, hit the breakpoint, I'm really happy. All I have had to write are these, in this case, one line of code that says sleep for a second uh, because I want it to simulate work. All I have to do is write the code that I wanna run when an event gets dropped on a queue. This is a super productive programming model. Uh, I'm just thinking an event-driven world. But now I wanna run this in Kubernetes for some reason, and I'll get to that after the demo. So the first thing I wanna do I need to do a one-time install of Kata on my cluster. 
So in order to do that, using the Azure Functions tooling, I just run func Kubernetes install. It's going to connect to the Kubernetes cluster that I've configured my machine to talk to. In this case, I'm talking to a Kubernetes cluster in Azure's Kubernetes service. And it's going to go and install the brains of the scaling logic in Kubernetes. In fact, here I can use the tooling to say, hey, look here at my Kubernetes cluster. And it's going to talk to AKS. And it's like, hey, yeah, you have this thing now called CADA. It's now monitoring Kubernetes for you. And it's going to detect new functions, new containers that are CADA enabled, and scale them like a function. So now that I have my cluster ready to go, let's deploy my function. Now, I can take any function, as I mentioned. The only requirement is you do need a Docker file. We've made that easy for you as well. I can just write func init docker only. And that is going to look at my project, look at the language that I'm using, look at the dependencies that I'm using, and it's going to build for me a valid Docker image that now I could containerize my function and run it as a container anywhere. But in this case, I want to run it in Kubernetes. So again, even if you're not a Kubernetes expert, you can probably run the simple CLI command, which is func Kubernetes deploy. I'm going to call it my Q function. I'm going to give it my Docker Hub registry so that it can push this to Docker Hub to get it to Kubernetes. Here I can set how frequently it's to check for new messages, how frequently it should be looking at that queue. I'm going to say every three seconds. And here I can also decide how quickly it scales down. Uh, the default here is much larger, but I'm doing a demo. I want to show this, so I'm going to do it after five seconds. Now, when I push Enter here, it's now building that Docker image, which it already did. It's now pushing that to a Docker registry, which it just finished. And then it deployed a few artifacts to Kubernetes for me. So now it's ready to go. So if I now come here to my Kubernetes cluster, now I have my Q function. But in Kubernetes, just like in Azure Functions consumption plan, it's zero. It's scaled to zero. It's not running anywhere. It's not consuming any compute. I have told it that I'm interested in my queue. It's generated all of that for me, but it's not actually having to run any of it. Now, what we can do here is we can come here and watch the pods. And you'll see I have no pods right now. And I'm going to come back over here to my storage queue, and let's add a message. So we'll say, hello, build 2019, Ooh. and click OK. And as soon as that gets dropped in the queue message, you'll notice that Kubernetes saw that there is now work to be done. It is creating my container. It's now running that function. My function has just consumed the queue message that was there. Maybe there's a lot of queue messages that are there. And once it's finished working, which it has now done, it looked again. It saw the queue message was empty. It's now terminating that container. And in about 20 seconds, it scaled up, ate the queue, and scaled back down to zero. All happening in Kubernetes powered by Kata. So that's what Kata allows you to do. And yes, great, I'll take that. I'll take that. So the last thing I'll show, let's do this one more time. Let's watch this empty pod. But here, instead of just dropping one message, I'm going to switch over to my, my remote desktop, which got closed down. And I'm going to run a simple script that's actually going to drop thousands of messages on that queue um, right here. And so let's go ahead and run that and hurry and get back to the terminal. So same demo, but here, instead of just dropping a single message in the queue, I'm going to drop a lot of messages on the queue. You'll notice right away, it saw that there's a lot of messages coming up. It's now started to spin this up. But as I continue to talk and kind of wrap this up, you'll see that Kubernetes is going to say, oh, wow, it's not just one message on the queue. There's a lot. So now it's spinning up four more instances of that function. It's probably going to go up to 16 and then 32. But Kubernetes is now scaling out very rapidly the same way that we do in the consumption plan so that I actually now have multiple instances um, that are all spinning up to consume those queue messages, all being driven from within Kubernetes. No code changes. I wrote my functions in the same way. I could take the same function, and I could decide, you know what, Kubernetes sounds really cool, but I really don't want to have to manage any of this stuff. I'd rather just publish this to the cloud and have somebody else wake up at 1 in the morning if something breaks. You can just publish this to the Azure Function Service, and then Alex has to manage it and not you. Uh, that's totally an option for you to do. Uh, but we wanted to give you flexibility. We know a lot of people, yeah, there's a lot of queue messages getting dropped in. There's a lot of people who are anxious about, like, hey, what about lock-in? What about when I need to run in different environments? And Kata is our world where we say, hey, take the function's programming model, take all of the productivity that it brings, and you can run it exactly where it makes the most sense. And sometimes for your business, for your requirements, that might be in Kubernetes. But we want to give you that same rich, productive experience, and that's what Kata is doing. So, 
to kind of uh, wrap up a little bit of what you've seen here, when should you consider Kata as someone who is interested in Azure Functions? So one of the big scenarios here is we work with a few companies who are working on intelligent edge solutions, maybe on-premises solution. They want to be able to run functions too. They want to be able to run functions that can scale. Uh, Kubernetes is a phenomenal story to run on the edge. Um, you know, we, we were, we're working with retailers right now who want to have functions that are monitoring a bunch of stuff in their retail stores. They can take those functions. Their developers just think in terms of functions. All their devs are writing are Azure functions. But it's up to the operator to decide, hey, in this world, this function actually makes sense to run on premises, potentially in Kubernetes. You might already have existing Kubernetes investments. Maybe you're using some type of a service mesh. Uh, you, you're, you've got a bunch of other apps in Kubernetes locked down in a VNet. You could run it alongside those existing investments. If you did decide you wanted to take your toys and you're like, you know what, I don't want to run in Azure anymore. I don't want to be tied to Azure Functions. I want to go around in, in some other cloud provider platform. You can do that too. That's OK. Uh, I'll be sad. It'll break my heart. <laughs> Send me a tweet before you do it and say it's not you, it's me, uh, or whatever you want to say. Uh, but you can do it. We're going to give you the tools to do it, all for free. Uh, and you can do it faster if you star that GitHub repo, github.com slash kata core slash kata. <laughs> Uh, and uh, if, you, if you, for some reason, decided, I actually want more knobs, I want more control, I'm moving further back in the spectrum of productivity and control, uh, Kata gives you full control over exactly how it's scaling, exactly how it's behaving, where you likely don't want to have to worry about that, but you can if you so want to. Securing, Alex. Oh, that took a lot longer, so we might have to jump through this one oh, uh, no, it's a little good. fast. We're doing dynamically scalable serverless gap filling, yeah. <laughs> right. What Jeff will never tell you is that his annual bonus is directly tied to the number of stars on that GitHub repo. <laughs> um, in pennies, too. So right now I have like pennies. a dollar and 24 cents is going to be my annual bonus. Um, uh, yes, here we go, Boise, Idaho, for my ooh, summer vacation. One uh, beer in Seattle. Yes. Um, so moving, moving right along, you, you figured out how to host your serverless application, you built a proof of concept, and now you've got to get something that actually passes a security review and you'll ever get anyone to allow you to pass production data through. And that's where we get to securing your serverless application. And the first thing I want to play is uh, a game that I shamelessly stole from Matt Henderson, only for those with very good vision, called Spot the Vulnerability. And since there's a very, very deep room, I'm going to make it a little easy. There is this credential in plain text inside of this serverless application. And you may think, hey, cool, well, I don't know, my application's up in Azure. It's, it's secured by Satya's overlooking gaze deployed in Azure, but almost always this application will get deployed from somewhere else. You'll check it into source control. You'll have it on your local dev machine. There are a bunch of different ways that people can get access to your source control and you want to, or your, your source code, and you want to make sure that somebody looking at your source code doesn't immediately own your entire application. So for a while, we've been recommending everybody use Key Vault to store all of their secrets, and this is what it looks like to store uh, to retrieve your Key Vault secrets from within your code, but this is kind of old school. This is importing the SDK, making the connection, retrieving the secret. We think we can make this a little bit easier, uh, and we have two different ways to do that. Um, the first is a way to connect to Azure services that is, in fact, even better than using secrets at all. It is managed identities for Azure Functions. This allows you to use Azure Active Directory managed service identities to connect directly to services using your application service identity. Um, the way this works in Functions is twofold. If you are calling into a Function app, you can configure Azure Active Directory authentication to authenticate your incoming traffic against that service endpoint. And then if you have something that needs to trigger off of your application, something like a Cosmos DB, a queue, you can configure that queue with a service principle as well, and it will automatically authenticate as it's calling into your function app. Uh, but we also have the ability to use managed identities for calling out to resources, and this involves a token service, a local token service that we stand up inside of functions now that allows you to use your service principle to get a token in the runtime without having to connect to AAD, without having to do that whole authentication flow. You just ask the token service for a token, and then it gives you that credential. Um, this, is, this is a credential for your service, so it's not a, not a user credential. It's something that you can configure and administer. Um, it's kind of separate from whoever is actually deploying to the application. 
So this is awesome for first party Azure services, things that support managed service identities, but there's a lot of stuff that doesn't that you still need to use good old fashioned connection strings. And that's where Key Vault secrets come in. And we've lit up, uh, just, just recently, early this year, we lit up Key Vault references for application settings. This allows you to add a reference, just like we have up there at the top in that teal bar, that lets you reference your Key Vault and a specific secret and version. And then when we open, when we load up your function for the first time, we're going to resolve those settings to actual Key Vault references. So rather than having something like a storage connection string or a secret in your application settings, you store this Key Vault reference and it allows you to keep that secret in a centrally managed place so that somebody glancing at your function app in the portal does not automatically know all of your secrets. Um, this is, this is really awesome. It's currently in preview. Uh, one of the main features that we're looking to get by GA is the, the ability to auto-rotate secrets. Uh, right now, you can see up here, I actually think I have a laser. Oh, it's not very bright. Um, you can see that the secrets require you to have a secret version, and this is because the versioning is still something that you have to do manually. Um, as always, good security hygiene is to be rolling your secrets periodically so that somebody that compromises your application doesn't constantly have persistent access to your application. And so right now this involves doing a deployment where you change that secret version and then redeploy your app so it pulls that new secret. Perfect. Ooh. And that's a fantastic, like we see a lot of people who ask us, hey, I have an event hub connection string. How do I get that connection string in my code in a safe way? Maybe I need to use the same connection string across a few apps. I don't want to have to copy paste app settings and maybe I don't want them in app settings at all. What Alex just showed is a fantastic way where you don't have to change your code at all. It's just in your app settings, you say, hey, go to Key Vault and get my event hub secret. We will go and go to Key Vault for you, assuming you gave us permission, the, the Azure function permission. Uh, the Azure function will then retrieve your secret and inject it into your app for you. So all of the kind of, hey, I need to get something from Key Vault into my function app, we've automated that, and you just need to make sure that you add that cool Key Vault reference. So great job, Alex. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, oh, uh, are you the first one implementing? Uh, am I the first one implementing? I think I'm the one. You're the first one implementing. Yes, you implement this is, first. This is, this is the moment Here. I have been waiting for for the last year, <laughs> which is uh, dependencies. Now, I've been on the Azure Functions team now coming up on two years, and as part of that, I usually run uh, our Azure Functions monthly webcast. And one of the things that I learned during my first few webcasts, because this was not something that I was very good at, because I'm a PM, I only write crappy code, uh, is that there's this real problem when you write applications, which is managing your dependencies. And previously, if you're writing a function, you had to write something like this, where I have a dependency here on an HTTP client, and I have a dependency here on a SQL connection. And in order to make sure that I'm using those connections safely, uh, I am now creating singleton, private, static, HTTP client stuff here. But this even gets worse if I have dependencies on other methods, on other implementations. Because now whenever I want to test my function, I need to somehow figure out how to get in a mockable SQL client here. It, it's just a pain. And, and I guess the world has solved this problem, or at least made a lot of progress on it, and it's through this wonderful feature called dependency injection, which is now available in Azure Functions starting today, very easy to use, uh, so that you can use dependency injection in your functions. Yeah, you don't have to hold it back. This is, this is a long one coming. So we've been very hard at work on this. This has been a very highly requested feature. Uh, honestly, there's a lot here. We've documented it at the bottom. Uh, I would even say we've just scratched the surface on some of the amazing stuff that you can do when you do this. We just build directly into the .NET dependency injection abstractions. Um, so we're leveraging how .NET Core is doing this, uh, using the same stuff, if you're familiar with writing .NET Core apps, um, using their like MVC dependency injection, we're doing the same thing. We're not trying to reinvent dependency injection. Scopes work the same, uh, building works the same. Uh, which is good, because we want this to work how you expect it to. There's an extension, or there's a NuGet package that you can pull into your C Sharp functions that will give you the builder and allow you to set your startup class. I'll show that in a second. You can then create something like a startup.cs and tell it, hey, when you're spinning up this instance, here's where I want to register all of my dependencies. Here I want to run my startup code. Uh, and then you can s create your functions in a way that will then get those dependencies injected in, decoupling them, and taking advantage of inversion of control. So here is a function that is wired up to do dependency injection. Let me Ooh. zoom in a little bit here so it's easier to see. 
So this is an HTTP function. And it's getting in a request over HTTP, and it's generating a greeting. So somebody sends in a name. This is just like our Hello World example. And I want to generate a greeting for that person. Now, in order to create a greeting, I might change how I'm going to greet this person, depending on whether I'm testing the app, or I'm publishing the app, and everything else. So I actually have, you'll notice one thing I want to call out. This is not a public static method. This is a public async method. This is not static anymore, which we previously uh, required you did. And I also have here a constructor. And here my constructor, when I am going to construct a function, I'm going to get an HTTP client so that I can take advantage of the HTTP client factory to allow me to safely reuse my connections and take advantage of all the DNS awesomeness that HTTP client factory provides. And I'm also going to pass in some greeter. I don't know which greeter. I have an implementation of a greeter. I actually have two greeters that I've defined. One of them is my build greeter, which says hello from build. And the other one's just my default greeter, which just says hello. So it could be either of these greeters. My function doesn't actually know. It just knows it's going to get a greeter, and it's going to be injected in. So then the last piece here, I have my startup.cs file. I have to, this is all documented, but I annotate this using this annotation that says, hey, this is your function startup class. Uh, so I'm saying, hey, I've got this function startup class. Make sure this is where you go. Like, this is where you go to do the startup thing. And here's where I'm able to register my services. So here I've said, hey, add the HTTP client factory stuff. I've installed that into my, my, uh, my project so that now it can create and instantiate HTTP clients in a safe and reliable way. I'm saying, in this case, I want to register my build greeter as the greeter. So this is going to inject in my build greeter when it runs the functions. I'm just doing this as a singleton service. I could also do this as a scope service, which means that it would create a new instance of my build greeter for every execution. And I could also do this as a transient uh, service, which would mean it's going to create one every time I access it. And then finally, too, I just want to show this pattern. I'm not using it in the demo. I could do something like create a singleton connection to SQL and register that here. So now if I came to my function and I said, hey, I actually also need a SQL connection, that it would do that in the same way where I'm going to have a singleton connection, and it's going to inject it in for me, and everything's going to be happy. So now I don't really need to run it, but I could run this now. It's going to spin up using the new dependency injection features. I could go make that builder much more complex. I could go inject in some entity framework stuff. I could inject in whatever else I want to do. Uh, but if I go ahead now and just call this function, once it spins up, it's going to give me my build greeting, because that's what I registered it to do. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to demo it, because you probably already guessed that it's going to work, because <laughs> all my demos always work. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it does. So I'm, incur I'm really excited about this announcement. Please give this a shot. Uh, let us know if anything's not working for you. But this will enable you to write much more easily testable functions, much more easily abstracted functions, uh, taking advantage of the same best practices that if you're already using .NET Core and things like MVC, it will feel very familiar to you. Woo, woo, woo. Oh, and I already did the demo. Spoilers. Yep. Um, so moving, moving right along, kind of our final gap to close in the, in the serverless world is how to actually deploy your application into production. And I really like this pattern of inner loop and outer loop development. Uh, all of the inner loop stuff is all of our local tools, our core tools. That's something that I feel like we've been doing really awesome from the very early days. You can pull down that whole open source runtime, run it locally, and debug your code. But something that we've done a lot of work on recently is improving the outer loop, kind of the build tasks that you do infrequently when you're actually ready to release your code to production the source control, the CI CD, the deployments to prod, and especially in the serverless space, there's almost never a single serverless app that stands alone. You usually need multiple different function apps composited together to make one complete solution. And having some way to orchestrate that deployment across multiple sites is, is a necessity for almost every application. So what we've done what we've done recently is we've improved our Azure DevOps support. And for build, we GA'd the functions build task. I have that screenshotted over on the right. We now have proper first party support for Azure functions build tasks in DevOps pipelines. You can add them, add .NET, Node.js, Python, and then you still need to use uh, CLI commands for all of the preview, all of the other preview languages. 
Um, we also have a new streamlined CLI command, AZ function app DevOps pipeline create. This allows you to use the Azure core tools to create an entire DevOps pipeline all configured for you with your version control of choice. It works with GitHub or Azure repos, so any version control you want as long as it's GitHub or Azure repos. Um, this, this sets up the whole YAML for you, and we found that a lot of people loved the automatic DevOps control in Visual Studio. You can right-click on a project and create a DevOps pipeline from there, but I was, I was very surprised as a Microsoft employee to learn that not everyone uses Visual Studio. <laughs> and so this CLI command will let you create a DevOps pipeline in Mac, Linux, wherever better development environments are found. So, or alternate. Alternate. alternate development environment. Whatever your, are found. your favorite development environment is always Visual better. Visual Studio is my, uh, my IDE of choice. I love code, but man. So I'm over here in Visual Studio Code, very different IDE, uh, and I have a very simple function app set up. Uh, and I have my terminal over here, and I can run AZ function app DevOps pipeline create. Uh, and I'm going to step through this a little bit and then kind of pull a finished one out of the oven. Uh, when you hit this, command, it's going to ask you for your source control of choice, and then it's going to ask you for an app you want to deploy to. So I'm going to use my current directory's source code, and I'm going to give it a function app. Uh, I have DevOps Demo AK. Uh, this is going to create the whole YAML for me, and it takes about five minutes to deploy, plenty, plenty of time to go get coffee and pretend that you're working. So I'm going to go right over here to a function app that I've actually already finished that, let it deploy, create a DevOps pipeline for me. Uh, and for this function app, I'm actually going to push new code up to the cloud so that we can watch it go. Uh, I have source control. I have some source control over here tracking the changes that I've just made. I'm going, to com I'm going to stage those changes, add a message. I'm going to add my favorite build message. Uh, let's do building. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, always commit emojis directly to source control. Um, so I'm going to hop on over to my DevOps pipeline here, and you can see this is clearly machine generated from this template because it's called underscore build underscore alkarshi dash DevOps dash done underscore DevOps dash done underscore DevOps dash done. <laughs> um, definitely did not choose that name myself. Uh, and so over here I have my build task for this function app, and if I go into edit it, you can see the YAML that it's generated for me. Uh, this is awesome. This is all, all stuff that I'm seeing for the first time now. Um, this is tracking my, my uh, version control from, from that uh, code path, and it's doing that build for me. And if I ever want to go in and edit it, I now have a nice jumping off point for my build task. Uh, let, me go, uh, let me go refresh this and see if it's pulled up that new build. Oh, well. So hopping on over to the releases. Did you push the commit? Did I push the commit? I think you oh, just committed. Oh, that's what I missed. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for pointing that out here. Right. Let, me, uh, let me clear this and then push. Ha, ha, ha. I even had it in my history. I knew that I needed to push in the moment. Um, so here, that'll, that'll chew for a little bit. Uh, while that's uploading, I can go over to my release pipeline, and I can see in Azure DevOps we have this really nice visual release manager, and so I have this current... Uh, deploy task based on dropping this finished build, but it's very easy to add a new build, a new deploy task if I have another function app in here. I'll actually just search for it. If I have another function app that I need to deploy, it's very easy to add that and have a multi-step deployment. And I can add all sorts of different validation tasks in here to make sure that before I push something to production, it's actually correctly built. Mm. So yeah, here I can see my, I can see my uh, commit in here. And if you actually go into this commit, uh, it gives you, oh, never mind, it's already done. Uh, it, would, it would give you your, uh, yeah, there we go, it gives you your live logs as you're doing the build, so you can make sure if anything goes wrong, you have very detailed debug information about this build as it's happening. Yeah, this is awesome, because uh, I think oftentimes it's so easy to just focus on that inner loop. Like, hey, I'm going to build these cool functions, and then it's like, it's serverless, so I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Everything's straight to prod. Um, but unfortunately, reality then bites us in the butt, and it's like, oh, I can still write bugs even though it's serverless, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and so this is a super easy way to just get you jump started into DevOps so that you can say, hey, I'm going to check something into source control. It then needs to build, run tests, go to a staging environment, maybe run some more tests in the staging environment, then finally move its way to production. Uh, so you get this really healthy outer loop, but one of the big principles we really care about as a team is throughout your entire journey on serverless, and hopefully this has been apparent through the Kubernetes stuff, through the DevOps stuff, we want to make you feel as productive as possible, 
even though you need this fully featured platform that includes monitoring, that includes DevOps, that includes potentially running in other platforms. Uh, so this is a great example of like, hey, I want the good DevOps stuff, but don't make me lose this five minutes to wow that I got with Azure Functions. Give me that, but also give me DevOps. So this is a great example. One command, you get this full pipeline set up that it looks like Alex's is now finished. It's yeah, built. so I used to have a code that said, well, hello, DevOps. And then when I hit it again, after it starts up, it's going to tell me something different. Nope, it's going to tell me the same thing. Yeah, has it released yet? <laughs> Probably hasn't released yet. <laughs> just so I thought I talked long enough for you, Alex. It's no, deployed. it's okay. I wasn't actually expecting you to talk long enough for this to finish at all. Oh, now okay. I feel like that's we're, fine. That's fine. We're cutting it too close. But yeah, it's still, it's still chilling. It will over deploy. Here. His demos always work too. Don't worry. Demo, Trust I mean, me, it, it worked before. Uh, great. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So let's go back to our presentation here. So uh, yeah, so more, we've got even more serverless sessions. Uh, if you can go back in time to yesterday, I gave a great one on using Blazor and Azure Functions on, uh, on for serverless websites. You made the right choice by being here today at 10 a.m. Uh, we've got another session this afternoon in the theater, which is going to give you some best practices and tips for writing functions. Uh, one of our CDAs is giving one about webhooks in real-time apps using SignalR and functions. Uh, I've got one that's going to kind of go over about the Kubernetes and serverless stuff. It's a little bit of a repeat of that content, but I'll spend a little bit more time on the containers and Kubernetes piece. Uh, but you're welcome to join that as well. Uh, I'd also highly recommend that Good, Bad, and Ugly of Serverless with Burke and Cecil. Yes. They're two of our awesome CDAs, and they've built a pretty cool scenario that they're going to walk through in Serverless with a web app. Uh, and durable functions, which we did not cover today, that everybody should know about, and we have brand new patterns that let you do actor-like capabilities using durable functions, fully serverless. Matthew Henderson's going to cover that on Wednesday. He's got a really fun demo for that one as well. Uh, so I think those are all the yeah. Ah, we have one more. Oh, yes. Ha, ha, ha. We, have, uh, we have a community project. Uh, it's actually a, a Microsoft project that supports the community called the Serverless Community Library. This is a set, of, a set of templates that you can deploy to Azure to get you started with functions. They have a bunch of more integrated, more, more kind of detailed templates than you're going to get just going through the docs. So if you have widgets that you want to deploy, usually the Serverless Library is a great place to jump off and get started. Uh, the other one I'll plug too. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, before before I even stop talking, and I'll, I think we even have a few minutes. I don't see mics, but we'll do a few questions as well. Uh, give these things a shot. So like the demo I did on Kubernetes with Kata, we have that exact tutorial step by step. Even if you've never used Kubernetes before, it's really fine grained. Like I wrote it with the mindset that people might run this who've never used Kubernetes. If you go to GitHub.com/KataCore/Kata. Uh, it has that instruction, so you can try it out. Dependency injection, we have the docs there. Alex showed the docs for um, uh, the DI stuff. Yeah. Uh, or, I'm sorry, not DI. DevOps stuff, premium plan. Give this a shot. Go test them out. Hang out in your hotel room and run on this stuff. Uh, and then the last plug, if you're using the Build app, it's going to ask you for an evaluation. Please submit your evaluations. Uh, that actually goes a long way to decide how many sessions we get to do at conferences like Build and Ignite. So we would love your feedback. Uh, let us know what you liked, how you'd like to see these run in the future, uh, what went well, uh, and especially what went well. Uh, so anyway, Alex. Yeah, we have time for Q&A. Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll have to repeat the questions because I don't see mics. But we have five minutes before they kick us out. And if you have other questions, we'll both be at the booth downstairs the whole week. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your builds.